Hello and welcome to this next Imish video. Right, so if you do not know who we are, then please check out the link in our description and you can find out some more information. But basically we have a huge library of at the time of making this video, 1,300 assets for ArcViz, which is one of the biggest uh, independent ArcViz Blender libraries available. So if you wanna find out some more information, then please check out the link in the description. Right, and if you have followed our channel in the past, you will know that we have created a variety of ArcViz tutorials and they are feature length. They are very, very long tutorials, but they do cover from the very beginning step all the way up to post-production. But the problem is I do know some people do not have time to sit through these whole videos. So I have put together some of the top tips that I have in all of these videos and made my top 10 tips for ArcViz. And these should all, if you follow these along, should generally help you create some better images in general, but it should be in a much shorter format. Right, so the first thing I'm gonna be talking about and that is keeping the camera at 90 degrees. This is probably one of the most important steps and one of the easiest to do, and yet I see it being done time and time again, not at 90 degrees. And some people argue that it's not so important, it's totally fine. Why does it need to be 90 degrees? And some even say that it is their own artistic license. But I just have to say that a wonky camera, a camera which is not 90 degrees, just looks bad. It looks unprofessional and in general, all professionals who do ArcViz keep the cameras at 90 degrees. It's so simple to do and it is a rule and generally it is a rule not to be broken unless you really wanna try some other styles. If you're starting out in ArcViz, put your camera at 90 degrees, it will look better. If you have done it for a while and you wanna try new things, then go for it. But generally it is a newbie error which I see and that is not keeping the camera at 90 degrees. If we check out a, a portfolio page such as Behance and we just scroll through all of these images, you will see that not one of them has a camera which is not at 90 degrees. And it's very simple to understand why it is important because if you keep your head straight and look across the other side of the room, you'll see that all the lines are straight not one line is wonky. And even if you turn your head, your brain has a mechanism to rotate your eyes to try to make sure that everything is straight. So that's what your eyes are used to seeing. And if you show a photograph where the walls are slightly falling, it is a very unnatural feeling and it just makes it feel like the, the room is falling. Now there are of course some times which it is fine to do. Uh, sometimes there are certain situations where you might wanna put the camera really high up in the air to look down into the room. And that one is so different from the general I sight from, from a normal human perspective that it is okay to look this different because the brain doesn't think, well, usually when I look at the room from this particular angle, it looks uh, straight. You know, it, that doesn't happen. And also there are times where you might wanna do a more close-up shot, like you're looking down onto the side of a of a shelf and, and that could be a focus where not all the lines are straight up and down. And that is also fine because if you think, if you are a person and you lean over to look at this particular object on a shelf and, you're, and your brain is used to seeing it in this way, so it doesn't try to auto correct it. So in certain cases it's fine, but in general, if you have a full room, an interior room, an exterior room, and you have it at normal camera eye height, put it at 90 degrees, you can't go wrong. But if you do not do it, then you can go wrong. So I think you see the importance of this and I cannot stress this enough. And that's why I put this at number one. Right, so post-production is one of the most important things that anybody can learn, any 3D artist in general, not just for ArcViz. If you wanna get into 3D, you have to learn some form of post-production. And I do know that it scares some people away because it is a bit, it can come across as a bit daunting, but there are so many good resources online to teach you some very basic adjustments which you can do to elevate your image. It doesn't really need to be super complicated, uh, but I do recommend you get a trial for Photoshop or download Affinity Photo, which is much cheaper, and find some tutorials online on some tips on how to push your images to make them look nicer. It is very, very rare, and I would argue almost never, you can never download, get an image straight out of Blender and it'll be 100% perfect and 100% finished. I would argue that you'd always need some form of post-production to push a certain point, even if you use a mask to elevate some glass or, or use some other uh, techniques to push the brightness outside to make it look more realistic. There's always something you can do in post-production to elevate your image. Now, 
these can these techniques can be quite complicated but in general there are some very easy tools and very simple techniques that you can use to push your image. You can do this in the Blender Compositor, a lot of very basic adjustments, but I do find the Compositor to be generally quite slow, and I do personally love Photoshop. So by the time I've saved the image in, in Blender anyway, I'm gonna put it into Photoshop and adjust it later. And I do find that also to be easier for me to go back into Photoshop if I want to, if I see it the next day and I want to change it a little bit easier. Um, so yeah, but whatever package you, you prefer, Photoshop, Affinity Photo or the Compositor, please find some tutorials online to really learn how, what are some basic things you can do to elevate your picture. I do want to release a YouTube series or, or a course or something because I do love Photoshop and I really want, I really want to stress the importance of this step because it is a very important step. Okay, so I love mood boards. I think that everybody should be using mood boards. I use it for every single project that I'm doing. I create a Pinterest page. I gather stuff together. I use um, Pure Ref a photo application on Windows to put together loads of resources and to build a, a mood board for the kind of thing which I'm going for. I do know that some people say that mood boards are cheating and I think that is just a complete misconception. Mood boards doesn't mean you find one image that you like and you replicate this one image exactly. The idea is that you've, you build collections of, of images for different things. So you might find a collection of images for how you want the sofa to be set, how you want the lighting to be hit, maybe some mood boards for the type of uh, colors that you're looking for or other mood boards for how you want the flooring to be. The idea is that you wanna build loads of different images that, that can inspire you to create something that is new and unique. It doesn't mean just creating one-to-one. -one. Because let's say, for example, you want to create a Mediterranean image. How many Mediterranean images do you have in your head to really understand the types of bricks that they use, the type of flooring that they use, or what color the doors usually are? You know, you want to create a, a library that you can access easily for the type of image that you can create. And if you are not using them, then you're limiting yourself to the very limited knowledge that you have of that one particular topic. If you've spent your whole, whole life making Mediterranean images, then I'm sure you have a very good idea of how to do it off the top of your head. But I very doubt, but I doubt that every single artist, especially a new person, has all the information in their head and accessible for every single image that they need to create. Mood boards should not be forgotten about and it can help you create images a lot better than using images out of your own head. Okay, so the next one I want to talk about and that one is using the Sun Positioner add-on. This one comes in 3D Studio Max and I use it all the time, um, but it does actually come with Blender as well and that is incredible and I don't ever see anybody using it. So what this does, it allows you to link the Sun to any sky texture or HDRI. And not only that, you can tell it where the render is in the world and choose the specific time of day, which is very, very helpful, especially if a client comes to you from, let's say, London, and they say, yeah, we have a new project, but we know that the sun comes in at a particular angle and we really wanna showcase that uh, beautiful sunset against our building. And otherwise, you'd, if you didn't have this sun position at all, you would have to then go online try to find the location and use one of these online tools. But this can be done directly in Blender and you can, you can use the sun lamp in the viewport as a reference of the angle. And I find this very cool and very interesting and never seeing it being used. So yeah, check this out, give it a play and you might actually be able to use it in your next project. And I'm sure that your clients will very much appreciate it. Not only can you choose the time of day, but this can also be animated. So you can create a time-lapse animation for your client as the, as the camera's moving through the building and you can have the sun actually going across the sky and going down in a time-lapse into the sunset and it will look very beautiful, I'm sure. Okay, so shadows, they can be actually beautiful and they can actually be boring. So you can have a, a sun coming through the back window and it'd be casting a nice light onto the wall and you could think that's finished, but there's so much more you can do with it. Let's say the sun is coming through the back window and it's hitting a tree. This tree will cast some very nice tree shadows onto the wall and it will break up the 
break up the light in such a beautiful way that it adds detail and interest to your scene. And I think that that generally looks a lot more interesting and a lot more beautiful than just a standard shadow. If you have a light coming through a window and it's casting a shadow, try and do something with it. Try to make it interesting. You can use it into your storytelling advantage as well. Let's say you have a wet pair of boots on the floor and then you have a wet window and the window has some raindrops coming through but the sun is breaking through the clouds and it was just a stormy scene and now the sun is coming through and creating a nice wobbly raindrop shadow on the wall. That is telling something a lot more interesting than just the sun, sun's coming through the window and that's that. You know, use it to your advantage and make them pretty. They are your friends and there's so much more you can do with them. Okay, so now let's talk about getting stuck into the same old, same old style. I see lots of portfolios and time and time again I see them where they've created a beautiful render two to three years ago and then they create another render that's very similar and then another render and all their images kind of look the same as if they found their own uh, favorite style and then never broke away from that. So their portfolio becomes very same, 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 same. And I do know that that can also be very nice and you might be catering to a specific type of client and you might be getting enough work from that and then that's very cool. But if you're looking to find new clients and interest people and to make them love what you do and to or to get a new job somewhere, if you have a portfolio which shows a variety of different techniques, you've tried to explore different lighting situations, different types of modeling certain rooms or just generally go, trying to go out of the box that portfolio will look so much more interesting than another one. It obviously depends on the type of work that you're trying to go for, but if you are not actively trying to find new techniques to improve your styles, you will stagnate and you won't be able to push even the style which you created two to three years ago, which you love so much, you won't then be able to elevate that to its next level. You will be learning ArcViz until the day you die. You'll be learning new techniques and you'll be improving time and time and time again. It is very rare that somebody will hit the peak and then that's that and they think that they can never get any better. If you're starting out in ArcViz, I recommend that you try to follow tons of tutorials, learn new things and actively engage in the ArcViz industry to find new things, new interesting ways to make your images cool. So Blender is open source and it is a very cool tool and because it is open source and it is a cool tool, it does mean that it is very accessible for people to make plugins for it. And generally there is, if you get, and generally if you get stuck and you think, oh wow, I really need a tool for this. There is a saying that there is an add-on for that. I guarantee that if you get stuck in any kind of way and there's a specific thing that you need to be done, somebody has already made an add-on for that. So I recommend you search online for any kind of tools if you're looking for it, and I guarantee there is something for it. Not only are there add-ons made for Blender, but there are branches made out of Blender to create new versions such as eCycles, which decreases your render time by half or even more. So don't just get stuck into vanilla Blender and don't get scared about trying out new add-ons because, because generally they are made to help speed up your workflow and to make you more efficient in general. I know some people do get a bit daunted by the amount of add-ons and how they work, but once you start using them, you can't live without them. Like every time that I get a new version of Blender, I have to install all the new add-ons again because I, I can't live without them and I guarantee that that is the case for everyone else. Not only that, but there are free there are tons of free add-ons which come with Blender and they are made by creators but they are officially recognized by Blender so they come with Blender. So do check out those as well. You can just go to this list, go through them all, see if any of them interest you and just experiment. Just play with them and see if any can really help you in the particular work that you're trying to do. Okay, the next concept that I want to talk about is to make use of the medium, large and small details when creating a scene. This is ge a general concept known throughout the whole artistic community and it's not just limited to art, not just limited to arc viz, but it is something that should be taken seriously and something that can elevate your work and just generally help you to block out your scene in a way that is that the end result is more realistic. As an example in ArcViz, you could start out with a scene, you could put the biggest pieces in. So you build the whole room, you put the biggest sofa, 
where the bed will go and where the, maybe the kitchen will go if they have a bedroom and kitchen. And then the next idea is that you then think, okay, what medium sized details could I add to this scene? So you might think, okay, well, I'll start adding some cushions, some curtains, some carpets, and maybe some big lamps and just generally start feeling out where the room will go and how the people will interact with the room. Once that has all been filled out, you can then start working on the small details. So this could be where the coffee table, coffees will go, where the glasses will go. And maybe some, you can start doing some storytelling with this where somebody's shoes will be onto the side. Even to the point where you can add small details with materials. So let's say you have a, a chair leg which is quite visible in the scene but you think that the wood looks quite boring you could shift over the UVs to have to show a more interesting part of the wood in that particular part of the render just to highlight that object in, the, in a new way that looks a bit more interesting and all these things all these small things and all these medium things and the large all together make something that's more interesting and more realistic in general this was covered by Gleb and or creative shrimp i will link to his video in the comments and i do recommend you check out his video because he explains this in a lot better way than i have done but it is a concept that you should really take note of and it will really help you going forwards okay so the next one is going to be the final one and that is to add some dirt to your scene and i think that this is actually a little bit controversial because i see people on different groups like Facebook groups or Blender groups where someone has posted their render and you always have someone in the comments to say that this needs dirt and and I do think that this is important but to a point I see people who completely overdo it they add dirt and it makes it look the makes it look like everything's just completely dirty but there is a skill I think in adding a material and making the material look just enough variation so it doesn't look completely perfect but just enough to make it have a bit more interest a bit more detail which you wouldn't get from a plain material but that doesn't mean you need to go all the way to actually physically add dirt to the object i think that it is a misconception and i think that some people have misunderstood what this means and and they go too far but you also have to take into account right so people who if you're watching this you are getting into architectural visualization and in general you will be working with clients who have created a new project or a new renovation and ge in general you are going to be working with new kitchens new floors new windows new balconies everything in your scene created by the construction company will be brand new so everything will be perfectly clean and i guarantee if you add too much dirt your client will tell you to make it cleaner so you need to find a way to make the room have some sort of variation uh, to the materials to make it look like it isn't completely perfect like it can never be in real life but just enough to show a bit more interest and to make it look a bit nicer but don't please just don't add dirt trailing through the scene unless you have i don't know a dirty kind of project for whatever reason uh, use it sparingly but consider where it should go and look appropriate don't go too crazy. Okay, so thank you very much for watching. That is the ArcFizz top, top, ArcFizz top 10 top tips. And um, thank you for watching. If you have any top tips that you want me to cover in the next video, then please write in the comments and I'll try to include that. But yeah, like if you don't know iMesh, then do check out iMesh. It is in the link in the description. Every new member that we get helps us to create a lot more really more interesting content not only for them but also for youtube and for everyone else it really it really helps so yeah thank you for watching and i will see you guys very soon